So what I'm going to do in the next 17 minutes is take you on a 17-year journey. And I'll start by introducing you to a uh, unreasonable man who made an unlikely discovery about a bacteria that is simultaneously rare and ubiquitous. Then I'll talk to you a little bit about our clinical discovery program and what we learned along the way, which is transforming the fundamentally our idea of health. In fact, I hope to inspire you to participate in this transformation independent of whatever your field of innovation may be. And then I'm going to challenge your deeply held beliefs about the world that we live in and what it means to be human. Okay. So according to Shaw, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. We can forgive the author of Pygmalion the use of the male pronoun. The unreasonable man looks at the world as we do, but sees what we do not. That may not make them a visionary, they might just be delusional. But the unreasonable visionary does the hard work of validating what they see, and then takes on the almost impossible task of getting the rest of us to see it. Here is our unreasonable human. His name is Dave Whitlock. He's an MIT-trained chemical engineer on the spectrum, aren't they all? One day in the spring of 2000, Dave was watching horses roll in the mud and trying to entertain a young lady. She asked him, why are the horses rolling in the mud? And David responded, it was the insects. And she informed him that March, the, in March, the insects weren't out yet, so David got some more alone time to come up with a better answer. Knowing something about the chemistry of human sweat, he landed on the notion they were following a biological imperative to reconnect with ammonia-oxidizing bacteria that are found in the soil. So he collected some of this soil and brought it to his laboratory in a garage. Now, biotechnology has a garage story, too. Box checked. He incubated this soil in a media that approximated human sweat. And then, after it had grown out, he did the following experiment. He applied this to himself, and then he gave up bathing altogether. After about three months, he noticed some subjective improvements to his health. He cultured the bacteria back off himself, started growing it up again, and handing it out to his few remaining friends, several of whom repeated the experiment and also noticed some subjective improvements in his health, and David spent the next 10 years trying to get any of us to pay attention. But David was not idle. David established relationships within the academic community, published his scientific findings and some opinions in peer-reviewed literature, and filed for and ultimately was awarded patent protection for application of the entire category of bacteria to skin and clothing, at which point people started to pay attention. So let me introduce these bacteria. Ammonia oxidizing bacteria are obligate autotrophs. What that means is they cannot oxidize carbon for fuel. In fact, the only thing they can oxidize for fuel is ammonia. And they oxidize this to nitrite and nitric oxide, which are collectively known as reactive nitrogen species. And this is an incredibly important part of the global nitrogen cycle. But it's an inefficient process, and they have to oxidize 25 molecules of ammonia to fix a single carbon atom, and that has implications in terms of their dividing time and other metabolic processes. The one that we are working with is known as Nitrosomonas eutrophae. It's an ancestral keystone commensal. A keystone commensal is a participant within an ecosystem whose stabilizing effect on the ecosystem is way out of proportion to their numbers. They're ubiquitous. They are literally found everywhere. The fact that they are no longer found on human skin is the oddity. They're non-pathogenic. There's never been illness associated with them, even in compromised hosts. They're incredibly slow dividing. The one we work with is very fast at 8 to 12 hours. Several are known to go out as long as six weeks. And they're incredibly sensitive to surfactants, soaps, preservatives, fragrance components, all of the things that we apply to our skin, which we think may contribute to the fact why none of you have these bacteria on your skin. So we are holobionts. Holobionts are meta-organisms who live synergistic interdependencies with the microbiota that are on them. These microbiota uh, imbue us with attributes that are essential to our physiology, but are, we did not evolve them on our own, and they are not encoded in our DNA. And we accumulate these microbiota all through evolution, and they stick with us unless we do something to remove them. And when you put these bacteria back on human skin, 
they immediately start oxidizing ammonia and they restore intrinsic control over both local and systemic inflammation, local tissue perfusion, systemic blood pressure, they interfere with quorum sensors to help regulate the, the microbiological community, and they regulate mitochondrial function, among other things. And when you put these back and restore the system to its healthy state, we, so, we see physiologic responses across a variety of different systems. And these are the areas where we are in phase two clinical discovery right now. Hypertension, allergic rhinitis, migraine headaches, rosacea, atopic dermatitis, and acne. And the fact that they're across a variety of systems should tell you that our, our, our systems in our body are not restricted by the petty distinctions of academic departments. We function as a whole. And recently, as of last week, we just announced a successful phase two trial for acne where we met both clinical endpoints with no treatment-related adverse events at all. So what did we learn along the way? The first thing we learned is that we have lost a lot of microbial diversity. When we were hunter-gatherers, we had acquired over hundreds of thousands of years microbial coloni colonization, and most of that has been lost. So there's a long-term loss that started about 10,000 years ago and continues. But there's also shorter-term loss within a community. So if we put out a product and it interferes with the microbiota, either in our gut or on our skin, that loss can occur over durations of months to years. And then as individuals, we can change our behavior in ways that affects, uh, affects our microbiome. We can lose them. And it's very hard to find things that you do not realize that you have lost and the rarest of the rare, the hardest of the hard to find, are these keystone species. Because, as I said, their influence in stabilizing the ecosystem is out of proportion to their numbers, so their numbers are very small. And they may be nearly impossible to find outside the unlikely discovery of an unreasonable human. Which leads to a germ theory of health. Over 150 years ago, in this city, was the origin of the germ theory of disease. And a germ theory of disease, it's the presence of a bacteria or a virus or a fungus that causes an infection or causes illness. Well, it's an outdated idea because I want to propose a germ theory of health where it is the absence of a commensal bacteria that contributes parts of our physiology which we do not own, but we had acquired through evolution. And in the germ theory of health, because we don't know these things went missing, what we will see either subclinical or clinical evidence of illness, which leads me to the big question. Do we want to be treating disease or restoring health? Now, these are two very different types of activities. When we treat disease, what we do is we pick the disease we do a deep dive into the mechanism until we find a place where we can administer a novel, patentable, foreign substance to ameliorate the symptoms of a disease you don't understand. And we're actually pretty good at that. But that doesn't make anybody healthy. In fact, it takes us further and further away from health because we get higher order failure modes and we call those side effects. We're constantly fixing the last thing that we broke. But restoring health is different. And in order to do that, we actually have to have an understanding of what we mean by health. So I did some rigorous scientific research to find out what health is, which is to say I Googled it. And health is being defined as being free from disease. And that's not really too terribly surprising because we live in an age of chronic inflammatory disease. So being free from disease feels like being healthy. It's also defined as wellness. So I decided to look for wellness, but that didn't help very much. And interestingly, I want you to note that both of these are nouns. They are things. Health and wellness are considered to be things. And the FDA is silent on the matter. What I want to propose to you is an alternative uh, version of health. Health is an evolutionary legacy. It was defined on an evolutionary time scale. The bad news is none of us are healthy. We might be free of disease, but none of us are healthy. So how did, we, how did I come across? come to this, to this conclusion? Well, one of the key questions we had to answer was, did hunter-gatherers, before who never used any of the products that we've designed, have these bacteria on it, on them? Now, that turns out to be a relatively simple experiment to describe, but to go do microbiome sampling on hunter-gatherers in the wild is actually a pretty difficult experiment 
Fortunately, while we were thinking about it, someone went ahead and did it. In this case, it was Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello and Marty Blazer and Rob Knight, and they sent a team down and they lived in the Amazon with a group of Amerindians known as the Yanomami or the Fierce People, and they went at them with swabs and they brought the results back, and good news for us was indeed they are colonized on their skin and in their gut with nitrosomonads. But there were other findings. One, they had the most diverse microbiomes that had ever been studied, and two, they actually had genes for resistance to modern antibiotics to which they'd never been exposed, and if you want, I'm going to have an Ask Me Anything session, and we can just talk about that there. But the other interesting finding was if you look at their skin, it's immaculate. They are not plagued with any of the inflammatory skin disorders that plague us. They simply don't exist. They don't have acne, they don't have eczema, they don't have rosacea, they don't have psoriasis. You can do this yourself. Do a Google image search for hunter-gatherers, and you will not find them there. And skin is a biomarker for systemic health. It happens to be the one that you can see. And it's not just limited to that. There was a study done in Bolivia of a group called the Cymane, and they had the lowest instance of coronary artery calcification of any group of humans that had ever been studied. So this is what we look like. And I'll take this down in a second. I know it's gross, okay? But I want to make a point here, which is the incidence of all of these illness, acne, atopic dermatitis, rosacea, psoriasis, these are all increasing. Pediatric atopic dermatitis has tripled in the past 30 years. It's now 15 to 20 percent, depending on where you live. And if you follow those children for five years out, almost 90 percent of them will be carrying inhalers for asthma. And if you have any doubt about this, this is uh, uh, Dr. Leviso Morne, who is the CEO of Robert Wood Johnson. We are raising the first generation of Americans who will live sicker and die younger than their parents. So the question comes up: Why are we so inflamed? I mean, besides Trump. What has gone on with our... Infl the inflammation is the most destructive tissue process that we have evolved. You would expect it to be under incredibly tight regulation. And yet, we are suffering from epidemic inflammatory disorder. And if you, if you doubt it for a second, turn on the television in the United States, and within 30, minutes, within 30 minutes, someone is going to be telling you why you need to be on Humira. So here's what I propose. This is a new word. I've just coined it. I'm releasing it here at Hello Tomorrow. It's xenodysbiosis. Xenobiotics are foreign substances that are not typically found in the body. They can also be substances that are found in the body, but in excessively large amounts. Xenobiotics are these substances, these new chemical entities that we have created that we know very little about, that we've been throwing at this organ system, the microbiome, that we didn't even acknowledge existed. What could possibly go wrong with that? So the definition of xenodysbiosis is these are the clinical and subclinical inflammatory responses that we are suffering from as a consequence of this barrage of exposure to new chemical entities. And there's a critical piece of this. Those of you who are out there raising money and those of you who are investing know that if you, have an, if you want to raise money, you need to have a patent. And to have a patent, you need to have a new chemical entity or a new composition of matter. So we have an economic architecture for the products that we make that almost requires that we keep throwing chemicals and substances that we don't yet understand at this complex organism, this complex ecosystem, the microbiome, and we're already starting to see the consequences of this. The past 30 years have been epidemic in terms of emergence and amplification of these diseases. Now, why has this happened? It's because we have a broken economic architecture of these consumer products. And what I mean by that is that these consequences from this take place over a longer period of time. So to the companies that make the products, they are an economic externality. They are what we used to call in medicine SEP, somebody else's problem. But in fact, they're everybody else's problem. They're all of our problems. So we have an economic architecture that requires us to throw chemicals we know very little about, and the consequences which show up later, we deny the existence of the relation or the correlation with them. And then you have to go into the healthcare system, and in fact, we do the same thing there. So we have been tilting at microbes. This is from Ed Young. We've been tilting at microbes for too long, and we've created a world which is hostile to the ones that we need. 
and this question is now for all of you, because for all of the products and all of the areas where you innovate, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. The products that we make have health implications. So we're treating disease or restoring health. Maybe we can find ways to make health a primary design parameter no, what your, no matter what your product is. But the only way we're going to have to do that is we're going to have to reframe the way we see what it is that we're doing, the context in which that we work. Okay, and that context, that, that perspective is a combination of our identity and the context. The identity is the way that we see ourselves. Okay? And the context is the way that we see the world itself, that we live in, and that creates our perspective. So I'm going to do an experiment here for you. I'm going to give you guys a word. I want you to call forth an image in your head. Don't tell anyone what it is. Okay, we ready? Here's your word. Everyone got an image? Okay, how many of you, raise your hands, if there were any people in that image? Look around. I think I see one. And they may have seen this talk before. We took ourselves out of context. And we did it for a whole variety of different reasons. We think of ourselves as a thing. We're a noun. We're a human being. But I think that that is an abstraction that's wrong. And in fact, that abstraction was created here in Paris in 1643. Again, ask me anything, I'll explain what I mean by that. We're not a noun. We're a verb. We're being human. We are a complex process of processes existing in a much larger process of processes with energy and information and matter cycling through this. And we cannot take things out of context when we solve them. For all of you who are solving problems, I get it why we do it. We're dealing with very complicated problems. If we don't take them out of context, they're very difficult to solve. But when we take our solution and we put it back into context, context always reasserts itself in strange ways. And those ways can be side effects, they can be subclinical inflammation, they can be all sorts of things. But we need to pay attention to that. And maybe when context reasserts itself, what's happening is nature is tapping us on the shoulder and telling us to pay attention and trying to remind us who it is that we are. All right, we started with Shaw, let's end with Atwood. In the spring, at the end of the day, we should all smell like dirt. Thank you.